I'm going to start, uh, we, you know, we're a few weeks away from Artscape. We're just about a week or so away from Nine Artscape. Days. Nine days. <laughs> Nine <laughs> days. Not Good a counting. few weeks. Nine days in, on the countdown for Artscape. And we've got some great things happening for Artscape. But the good news today and is that we have finally selected our CEO for Baltimore Office of Promotion and Arts, and it's Donna Sawyer. Let's give Donna a big round of applause. Thank you. So, you know, this uh, really reflects on how uh, sometimes you have great things in your own backyard and you don't acknowledge it. You go out and you do these national searches and all of this, and boom. <laughs> right in your own backyard. Here I am. Here, here she is. Uh, Donna Sawyer has also served on a panel for the National Endowment for the Arts on the YMCA uh, Board of Directors, and uh, she's been really involved in the arts for a number of years, and I'm really happy that she's come back to her own city uh, that she loves and uh, is a part of an organization that we are so proud of that does so many great things and does it extremely well. Thank and you. so we only expect them to continue to be done extremely well, plus more. Plus more. Yes. OK. We'll up the game. So, uh, we, <laughs> I know you both. <laughs> so uh, we've got some great things uh, happening for Artscape. And so rather than I stand here, let's give uh, Donna a chance to act in her role. Thank you. The CEO. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the mayor for her support and encouragement and uh, the uh, remarkable search committee that uh, brought me to, uh, to light. And um, I am so excited about being part of this team behind me, because without them, um, Ooh, a lot of them. Oh, all yeah. of them. <laughs> There's a guy. <laughs> We've got a few at Boma, but uh, th this team is the team that um, creates great news about and for the city of Baltimore, and we will continue to do that in the future. And uh, with the mayor's support, with the support of the corporate community, the philanthropic community, the social community, and especially the arts community, um, we are all about making Boma well, making both a vibrant, but also making the city of Baltimore vibrant. So tell us a little bit about Artscape. Oh, Artscape. Um, as you said, nine days. <laughs> nine you days. can uh, see the pressure. Um, <laughs> but uh, we are um, expecting, as we have in the past, to have an economic impact on the city of almost $30 million. We have hundreds of, of artists who will be displaying their work. Um, selling their work, please come out and see it. Um, up and down Mount Royal Avenue, we have three stages. Um, well, three acts on our main stage. We have um, TLC. Um, we have um, Toots, Toots, Toots and the Maytals, Maytals and uh, ZZ Ward. And the most remark one of the most remarkable things, in Lyric Theater, we're presenting Garth Fagan Dance. And if you don't know who Garth Fagan is, he is the choreographer for Lion King. So we have top talent, we have hot weather, we have good food, and we have uh, the best party in the city. And to kick it off, um, we are awarding the Sondheim, Artscape Sondheim Prize on Friday, I'm sorry, Saturday at 7 at the Baltimore Museum of Art. It is a prize of $25,000 that we give to a local artist. And then we have um, finalist prizes of $2,500 for those who, the, who don't win the, the, uh, the prize. Yeah. Yes. So we're all about Baltimore, all about promoting the arts in Baltimore, and um, we'll just keep rolling. Well, I, I was going to say she has big shoes to fill, but Bill's shoes aren't that big. <laughs> I mean, he's his got legacy a lot of is big. His though. legacy is big. So yes. I'd rather say that uh, you've got a great legacy to follow, and uh, uh, we know that you'll be able to do it. And mm -hmm. You've got a great team, a really great team. I've worked with this team for quite some time, <laughs> quite some time. And so I know the capacity and capability of these folks, and so we look forward to your leadership. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Can you explain that for us? Uh, Donna, D O N N A, uh, Drew, D R E W, last name Sawyer, S A W Y E R. And you're coming back from where? I most recently was in D.C. I worked at the Hirshhorn Museum, 
and uh, I took a couple of years off to write a book. Um, and when I came to Baltimore, I was looking for a position and was lucky to get here. <laughs> this is probably one of the best jobs, um, being able to engage, entertain, and enlighten um, all of the citizens of Baltimore City. What was your role at the Hershey? I was director of uh, marketing and communications. Okay. All right. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you, team. Okay. You. See y'all at Artscape. Yes, we'll be there. Mm -hmm. Go, go. Pretty good, so. So these are cadets. Mm -hmm. I know you were trying to. But, yeah, but. <laughs> Let's get the wording down. So they're cadets in, not in the academy, they're prior to that. No, these are. <laughs> yeah, you can, you're confusing me. Okay. You're confusing me. So let me, let me start here first, okay? So you can't, as you all know, you can't get into the police department until you're 21 right. years of age. And um, we started a program, uh, the city had a program, it was a cadet program. And it was for young people who were interested in being in the police department, uh, 18 years of age, graduated from high school. And so the city had a program, but somehow we stopped it some years ago. And so I asked if we would bring the cadet program back. And uh, so we have. But what I really want is that these young people become the prize that the police department gets. One, they're city residents. Two, they graduate from our high schools. And three, they're really interested in becoming members of our police department. Look how, look at him, so serious, <laughs> so serious. Uh, but uh, that they become members of our police department and they get the kind of training that is needed and they understand the criminal justice system and they become members of our police department. I, I said to the uh, uh, commissioner that we really want them to be among the best and the brightest. And so I think we have, what, about 11? 11, 11 young men now, and uh, do we have any women? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. Oh, okay, we've got to work on that. But I can tell you, we did the high school, um, for the high school uh, jobs fair, I think they had the most attendance at their, I don't know whether they were attracted to these young men, but a lot of young ladies were coming up asking to be cadets. And so um, my goal is to get us to 20 to 50 and perhaps 100 of these individuals a year who are coming out of high school uh, wanting to be in our Baltimore Police Department. And so while we're starting power programs and we're working in our high schools, and I think the police department has one of the largest basketball leagues in the city, yep. about 700 young people from the ages of, I think, eight and up, mm -hmm. uh, this is about learning about being a part of a community engagement police force that's really going to learn about constitutional policing. I had a wonderful, so I want to take a moment to thank Dan, uh, because uh, Dan is with our Bloomberg team. And one of the things I said to Dan is that this should be an apprenticeship program, an apprenticeship program for a two-year period that leads these young people directly into the police department, and that they get paid and they get well-trained. Had a great conversation yesterday with the president of the University of Baltimore, Kurt Schmook. And what I said to him, this program, we should be working in partnership with the University of Baltimore. And so he's, uh, we will be sitting down, Dan, uh, the commissioner and others sitting down uh, with the University of Baltimore to really lay this program out so that it is meaningful, that there's learning going on, and that these young people really get a head start into becoming Baltimore City police officers. So yesterday, thanks to Dan and his work with the police department, we got certified, the cadet program is a certified apprenticeship program under the state of Maryland. Yay! <laughs> so y'all are certified, um, so, so I'm excited. I think that this is a, a great effort to increase uh, police officers coming from our city and uh, young people coming from our city, learning about community policing and becoming parts of our police department. Uh, we're also expanding our um, foot patrol people on the streets, so I'm going to turn this over. Uh, Dan, did you want to say anything about your efforts? Uh, no, I think you covered it, Madam Mayor. Did I do it? Yeah. Thank you. I'm Let me using... just ask a question. So should, are they automatically qualified for the police academy once they get through the apprenticeship? Once they get through the apprenticeship, they're, they're qualified. They still have to take all the requis requisite tests, physical, uh, the background is done as cadets. <laughs> 
but they, they are qualified um, once they, they're finished the, the, the cadet program. What sort of advantage does that give uh, someone coming into the police department uh, over someone who's kind of just coming out of you know, maybe two years of an associate program in college? So they, they get to learn the institution. They get to learn the culture of the institution, and that's, that's an advantage for, for anybody, uh, knowing how the organization works, knowing what the expectations are, uh, and what the standards are. So one of the things, because we've not laid it out completely, and that was why I had this conversation with the president of the University of, of Baltimore, I would love, and, and I can't say that it'll happen yet, but I would love to see this, you know, this two-year period end up with an associate degree of sorts that they've qualified for associate degree. So, uh, because they'll be learning and earning at the same time. They'll be learning about policing, they'll be learning about criminal justice, and they'll be learning about the police department. And it was interesting, I was telling someone the other day, I was at uh, uh, Marshall's, hey, Good home goods store, by the way. Uh, I was at Marshall's, and there was a young lady who waited on me. And I said, so tell me, uh, you know, what's your plan? She was about 20. She, in fact, she was 22. And she said, forensics, uh, not, which was interesting. And I said, uh, so where, I said, have you considered the Baltimore Police Department? And she said, no. So I didn't want to hold up the line. So I told her, I said, when I come back again, I'm going to ask you how you plan to get there. Because uh, you should join the Baltimore City Police Department, but I want to know what your future goals are. What I think uh, going through a associate's program, or what I'd like to see us do in this uh, training, is show all the aspects of policing. Because I don't think people who are just wanting to be pol Baltimore police officers understand all of the fields and opportunities there are in the police department. So what I love for these cadets to be able to get is a, a real overview of what, um, you know, not just patrolling the streets looks like, but what are the careers that are engaged, that can be engaged in as cadets that would be meaningful uh, as police officers. Okay? Just one quick, I may have missed it. What are what's the significance of being certified as opposed to well, you're a certified apprenticeship program, so you qualify for training dollars. You know, because when we talk about creating a, a program where you know, teachers are going to be required, um, somebody's got to pay for that. Uh, so we qualify for state, state grants and so forth. So, so the teachers been hired. Like, I guess I'm not really clear from how the program is going So we just got certified. So we just got certified. Now it is for us to lay out what that program is going to look like. Oh, so you don't have to like go to this council with a program and say, this is what we want to do with this program. No, we just we go to them and say, you know, we want to create an apprenticeship program that leads to a career. Uh -huh. And so this, this apprenticeship program will lead to a career in, in policing. Now, are these young men, prior to this state uh, funding that you're going to be receiving, are these young men paid right now, or will they be paid now? Cadets are paid. They are paid now? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Can we use the program, do you need to be a city resident? It, that's no. the preference. It is. That's the preference. That's a preference, yes. Yeah. Not okay. necessarily. Not necessarily, but <laughs> definitely a preference. So people were just, uh, if the program was just certified, there are 11 cadets that are already in the program? So the no, we have. So the city had a cadet program before. And mainly what a lot of the young people would do is come into the police department and they might end up doing some filing, you know, or whatever, but not really get a, a real view of the police department. In fact, I think I did a conversation, uh, they look so serious, I did a conversation with them about what they were learning and what they would want to learn. And they do want to know more, and so I think they're getting a little bit more experience yes, now in the police department. Yes, did you all want to share anything? Oh, I have nothing. Oh, please, nothing? Can, can we ask them? Sure, uh, sure. I don't know if they'll say anything. Why, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask where you guys are from and, and why do you, and also if you can spell your names, um, and why do you want to be uh, in the police department? Sure. Uh, my name is Malik Bradford Day. That's M -A -L -I -K, Bradford, B -R -A -D -F -O -R -D, Day. Bradford Day. That's M-A-L-I-K. Bradford, B-R-A-D, F-O-R-D, hyphen D-A-Y. It's a long name. Sorry about that. Um, I'm originally from Queens, New York. But I was mainly raised here, you could say. My mother's from Baltimore. Um, my father is a police officer, and I'm basically just trying to beat him to the stars. <laughs> my name's Cameron Sneed. It's spelled K-A-M-E-R-O-N. And Sneed is S-N-E-A-D. I'm originally from Hartford County, but my parents, or I have a family that work in the department, so I'm just following their footsteps. That's a good one. 
Yep. Good morning. Um, I'd like to announce that uh, as of yesterday, I signed a final order to uh, transfer 115 police officers to patrol. Uh, this transfer is, uh, in addition to that, we're also transferring 11 sergeants. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we're transferring 11 sergeants. This is all in uh, our effort to uh, lower the vacancy rate. Uh, currently, we're at uh, 18 vacancies per shift per district. With this move, we'll be able to lower that to approximately uh, four vacancies per shift per district. Uh, this is not the end all. We still have a lot more to do, but with patrol being a priority, with our, our crime fight being a priority, uh, we see the need to move these personnel. Uh, some will be reporting as early as tomorrow. All will be in place by Sunday. They're coming from uh, a number of places. Some places in uh, CID. Um, they're coming from the DDUs, the district detective units. Um, and they're coming from the 10th district, uh, Mobile Metro, uh, so a number of different areas. Does this, how does this affect the investigative side of the department's function? Well, there, there's an opportunity cost associated with these moves, obviously, uh, but in order to mitigate that opportunity cost, what we've done is we've taken the DDU sergeants, we've transferred them to the districts so that uh, we're gonna have officers, patrol officers, not only taking the original reports, but they'll also be following up on the investigations. They will then report back to those DDU sergeants that have the subject matter expertise, uh, particularly within the areas of, of burglaries uh, and ag assaults. Uh, in addition to these moves, we've also increased uh, citywide shootings uh, significantly. The, the number, um, if you go back to the, I think it was six. Was it 614? Mm -hmm. That's correct. The, the police department has nearly 3,000 employees. Yep. So what you're essentially showing there is that it really a very small percentage is on patrol. Is on patrol. Right. One third. Mm -hmm. so where is it? So they're, they're in a number of areas. So we have CID. Uh, we have a number of specialized units. But there's, as you can see, um, there's a number that says assigned but not available for duty. Uh, these are individuals that are either on medical, they're suspended, uh, military leave, um, and it, uh, that number fluctuates on a daily basis. So that 614 will fluctuate. Sometime it'll go up, sometime it'll, it'll go down. Um, as we look to get people out of positions that are currently being occupied, sworn personnel out of positions, uh, that we can have uh, civilians do. We're, we're hoping to do that. But until we can get those positions allocated to us on the civilian side, um, we still have a need to have the sworn personnel do those, do those jobs. So ideally what we'd like to do is get those sworn officers back or out of those civilian positions and back on the street and replace those with, with civilians. So, you know, I think earlier this, was it earlier last year, we transferred about 100 people out of civilian uh, positions and put them in patrol because I'm like you I'm looking at the numbers and I'm saying whoa you know what are you all doing so we got we got police officers doing civilian jobs we got a number of police officers who are, are on sick leave or whatever we're even tightening up that process because yep. you know we find that sometimes folks are just out too long and uh, so we're even looking at that entire medical contract and the process for for that as well um, but you should also note that these are uh, the folks who are on patrol, but this does not include uh, the commanders and all of those folks who are on patrol as well. So they're out there too, so you don't see those numbers too. Yeah. So it's not just, these are the people who are... Good point. These are, these are actual police officers, mm -hmm. right? Doesn't include supervisors, doesn't sergeants, start. lieutenants, no, doesn't, doesn't include any of those. those. Yeah. Commissioner, how would you come up with this idea in the first place? Well, the, the bottom line is um, we recognize that we needed to have an increased presence on the street. We needed to have increased uh, engagement 
increased um, uh, foot patrols, increased uh, motorized patrols. Uh, but then looking at that, that number, that vacancy number, average vacancy 18 per, per shift per district, was really disturbing uh, to me, not just to me, but to the mayor, uh, and recognized the need that not only is that, does that not serve the city well, but it doesn't serve our police officers well um, in terms of their, their wellness. Having to work consistently, work overtime, uh, we think that that's going to this is going to lower the overtime for us. We're, we know it will, right? Um, but uh, we you have police officers working 15-hour days. It just right. doesn't make sense. You know, drafting police officers to to work long hours. You can't be your best person. I can, but everybody. Can. <laughs> I'm sorry, but everybody can't be their best person 15 hours a day. Yes, no, four. Four. Uh, average of 18 per shift uh, uh, per district to, to uh, four. And that's what we were experiencing. And I think I, I shared this with you all that I, mean, I go uh, to roll call and I'm standing there waiting for more people. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, if we got this number, 1,900 or 2,100, wherever we are currently today, if we have this, why is this all I'm seeing? And I've been on roll calls early in the morning, late at night, and it just doesn't make sense. So um, I asked the commissioner to really take a look at this and how do we, you know, bring, how do we shift it in such a way that we can see more presence on the streets? You know, the 100 we added, fine, but it still didn't get to the numbers that we need to have on the streets. Even so, I think that in the line item budget, I'm probably thinking of the FY17 budget or mm -hmm. the 18 budget, I think it's like 1,851 or something like that is the line item for patrol. And we're still, that's only halfway there. Those are the positions that, remember, those are the positions that are allocated. Remember, we froze police positions for two years. You were losing 25 officers a month. You know, do the math, that's three, almost 300 officers a year for two years, that's 600. You know, to get back to 600, even last year was the first year that we actually, and that was just by a few numbers that we passed the attrition rate, you know, because we weren't meeting the, those leaving with those that we were even hiring. So last year was the first time, I think, and we were only up by like 10 or 11, you know, in terms of passing the attrition rate. So not only do we have to continue to hire, we have to continue to, to backfill. So we've never gotten to the numbers that are allocated, you know, so which is why it creates that overtime piece. We don't have those numbers in the police department. We don't have 2,800 people working in the police department. So Commissioner, how will you ultimately measure if this move of more officers to patrol is working? Well, I mean, it's going to be reflective in, in the crime fight. Um, as we, uh, particularly within the VRI areas, uh, the, the idea is that we get those areas, we, we hold those areas, right? So we, we have that continued presence, but we still need the, the capacity to, to uh, capture things outside of those areas. And that's what we're missing. Uh, this will help with that significantly. I'm sorry, Commissioner, what exactly were the 115 doing before uh, being sent back out? Various areas. Uh, some were in CID, some were in uh, the 10th District, uh, Mobile Metro, um, just various areas. So what will happen with those positions being moved out? Uh, I mean, is it kind of just like a shell game because now those people won't have the backing? No, no, it's not a shell game. These are real bodies, right? The, these are able-bodied working officers that are able, that will hit the street. It's it's certainly not a shell game that says, okay, we're going to take people who are on medical and then transfer them on on paper. We're not doing that. These are bodies that will hit the street as soon as tomorrow, uh, and everybody will be all 115 will be engaged by Sunday. And do you have specific areas where you want them to target? Well, the the assignments are right there. You you can see the numbers and where they're going. So I, that's, those are indicative of, of where we see the most need. I mean, just like for, for telling people, because people may not see the charts, so in terms of like people who are watching, if you, want, if you wanted to address like people in the city, like if you wanted to tell people uh, to get your message out where these officers were. Well, they're going to all nine, all nine districts. And, and so across the board, uh, where we see the need, uh, that's how we base the numbers uh, in terms of the, who, who's been assigned. So there, there are nine police districts in the city. So these have been uh, deployed uh, across those districts. And the balance is trying to 
uh, lower each of the requirements for each district from the 18 where we were down to four. So this is four less on every shift that we need. So we were looking at overall what we really need. We would add four more people to each of those districts to each shift. So this is where we are currently. How are the officers identified to the shift? Like how did you decide that officer X is available if you move from this position to this more qualified system? We had to look across the board. Um, we, we didn't want to hurt. Uh, everybody had to sacrifice in, in this. Um, uh, we didn't touch anybody in homicide. Uh, we actually increased citywide shootings uh, by 10 and two sergeants. Um, but all of, everybody else had to sacrifice. So uh, I don't think we, we didn't touch um, OPR or internal affairs. Um, but the rest of the units had to, uh, had to give up somebody. And we also um, just had a graduation class. Yep. So they're on the street. The, um, I think generally people would agree that when what people want to see is more police officers, mm -hmm. right? More uniform police officers. Sure. In other words, patrol. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be kind of the bread and butter of what a police department does. Mm -hmm. But in the BPD, that hasn't been the culture of the department. Am I correct? Has, well, has patrol gotten the short end of the stick for a while? I, I think it has, uh, um, it, mm -hmm. but the, the mayor's priority, and she said to me very early on, I want patrol to be that priority. Uh, I, I want, uh, you, ma'am, you mentioned that you, you wanted uh, to incentivize patrol. Uh, it's cr critically important, and when I talk to um, uh, the troops in the district, and within the specialized units. I, I make sure that they understand how important patrol is. You know, one of the things the commissioner shared with me is that you know, when he came in the police department to uh, become a sergeant was five or seven years down the road. Now it's three years you can apply to be a sergeant. And part of that is, you know, why is that we don't look at patrol as a pre prestigious area to be. And as you pointed out, Jane, uh, patrol is the, is the bread and butter of your police department. So why would we not be incentivizing folks to, to patrol the city, to get to know people, to build relationships? I mean, that's what community policing is about. So how are you incentivizing people exactly? No, I'm saying just in terms of, you know, how prestigious this position is. You know, reward people in those positions, whether it is an accommodation, certifications, whatever. You know, let's let people who are in patrol know that this is a great position to be in. This is what the community needs, and it is about developing that relationship. I know when we were growing up, everybody knew who the police officer was in the neighborhood, in the community, because you were attached to that neighborhood, attached to that community. And we want that kind of attachment to occur now. We want people to know who the police officers are in their neighborhoods, in their communities. And I can tell you, walking in and out of neighborhoods in our city, um, we were down in Brooklyn just last, uh, last week where we've added another violence reduction initiative area, walking with the community leaders, and they were like, this is what we want to see. We want to see more engagement of police officers uh, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. Did these officers volunteer, or were they picked? They were picked. Um, they, they, were they were chosen for such a time as this. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mayor, you and the commissioner announced the summer surge uh, a couple of weeks ago. How well is the summer surge working? Well, it. Um, you mean in terms of violence or yeah. violence going down? Well, we're pretty. We're still reducing violence. It's still going down. Uh, I think I told you we had an uptick in April. Uh, we trended way down in May in comparison to last year. Uh, we're probably neck and neck right now with last year's numbers in in uh, July. Uh, but you know we're still working on the month. But overall, violence is still down. Uh, about 20% in in homicides still down. Uh, in uh, non-fatal shootings, down in burglaries, uh, down in assaults, uh, really down in burglaries, I think is uh, almost a third. Uh, almost a third. Mm -hmm. So um, we we still got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of great things that are happening. I think we learned today that the Eastern District is just about fired up on a strategic decision center. Uh, the Western, we finally got permission from HUD as it relates to Gilmore Homes and putting up uh, some of the the cameras that we need over there. Uh, so. Everything seems to be flowing in the right direction, so we hope our results will continue to, to move in the right direction. Commissioner, can you, you clarify, you said you're moving people from the district detective unit to the citywide shootings. Is that 
into city into shooting. citywide. Into we, citywide, we, citywide shootings didn't lose anybody. They got a plus up of of uh, ten detectives and uh, two sergeants. And DDU doesn't have responsibility for shootings anymore. The no. So DDU does not have the spot responsibility for shootings. That the citywide shootings does. Uh, Madam Mayor, but when, when, when Taylor Hayes, when a seven-year-old girl is shot in the city, mm -hmm. you, you've got the numbers which look good, but then when you have a seven-year-old shot in the city, how do you... Let me just say this to you all, and you, you know how I feel about this. One person shot in the city is one person too many. And having a, a seven-year-old in a car and somebody shooting inside of a car is unconscionable. And um, I don't want to see anybody shot. I don't want to see anybody hurt. I don't want to see anybody dying on the streets of our city. Too many, and I'll say it and I'll continue to say it, too many illegal guns on the streets of our city. We have more guns in this country than we have people. Too many illegal guns in this country. And so um, we will continue to fight this fight. But the message to the community is, too, that all of us must take some responsibility. To shoot in a car where a child is, is, is in is unconscionable. But we also got to talk about how, how we protect our young people, how we protect ourselves, how we protect our communities. Um, and I know you all have the information in terms of what was found in those cars. I mean, guns, drugs, unacceptable. You know, don't put our children in danger. Don't put our communities in danger. And, you know, and that's why we walk up and down these streets. And I've said this time and time again. You know, stores that open, that accommodate drug trafficking, uh, allow people to come inside their businesses to operate are not acceptable in my eyesight, nor are they acceptable for the community. That's why we're uh, patrolling our neighborhoods and our communities. That's why we're identifying businesses in our communities that don't understand if you don't serve the community well, and you can't serve the community well, then don't serve the community at all. You know, shut down, allow us to have businesses in our communities that operate in the best interests of people. Commissioner, on the patrol issue, is it, you've now been in, in the city for a few months, and you've been in charge <laughs> for a couple of months. Um, what we, our experience is, and this has been for decades, is that you get these kind of spurts of violence, mm -hmm. which obviously suggests a lot of retaliatory. It, is it your philosophy that patrol helps deter that kind of what I'll call brazen, determined gun violence? It, it is, because just the mere presence of those police officers uh, in the communities uh, serves it as a deterrent. I mean, you know, we, we say that, that uh, today's trigger puller is tomorrow's victim. Um, uh, we, we know that re retaliation is huge in Baltimore, but there's something a little bit more fundamental than that. Um, the, the level of generational uh, violence um, is, is, is just not acceptable. Uh, and, and it sort of lends toward other conversations like domestic violence where a lot of this stuff gets started. So uh, the mayor wants to have a much broader conversation mm -hmm. about that. Um, but it's, it's, uh, I certainly do see that, that presence as a deterrent. So one of the things we're talking about, and you'll hear me talk about a little bit later, uh, because we haven't completely mapped it out, so don't ask me a ton of questions, okay, is about how we become a more 24-hour city. So I, I, I relayed the story to my cabinet that I was in New York, and uh, the person who was with me, we walked out of the hotel that morning, and we were able to cross the street, and we went on and we went to the conference. When we came back, we got, we drove back, and the uh, car said, oh, can't go up your street. And I'm like, wow, we had all these books and everything in our hand, so we weren't smart enough to walk on the side where our hotel was. We walked on the other side, and so we were walking. We get halfway up a New York City block, and we decide, can we cross over? He says, no, that's 300-degree tar there. I said, oh. So that meant we had to walk all the way to the end of the block, turn around, and come back to our hotel. When we came out that morning, the street was paved. And so the, the question um, that I brought to my cabinet is, you know, can we make Baltimore a more 24-hour city? You know, when we issue contracts to pave streets, and I'm not talking about in people's neighborhoods where they're sleeping, I'm talking about on these corridors of businesses and so forth. Can't we do that from 11 to 7 or 10 to 6 in the morning? When we talk about picking up trash on major corridors, can't we do that? from 10 to 6 or 11 to 7 in the morning. And so those are the kinds of things, and it goes back to the same thing that you mentioned, Jane, is uh, is the presence of more police on the street, does that help to deter crime? 
I think the presence of an active city also helps to deter crime as well. So that's something that we're looking at, and I'll talk about it a little bit more as we continue to work with the agencies and talk about how we can do that. Oh, by the way, you can pay your bills, your property taxes. You can pay those 24 hours in the city. So if you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, you want to go get a cup of tea, <laughs> come back, and pay your property taxes, we're live. So I think the schedule that the patrol works on, the figure is you need 1,200 officers for it to be kind of running smoothly. Still, even with these additions, clearly quite short of that. Will we ever get to that 1,200 figure? I think we can get there. Um, I think that, again, uh, we have, so we're working on all ends, Ian. Uh, we're working on the attrition rate, which we've dropped. Okay, we're getting more police officers into the academy. Uh, we now added this cadet program. You know, I, I think I projected it would take us probably another two, three years to get there, looking at where we've come from. Um, so yeah, I think we can get there. It's going to take time. Uh, it's heavy recruitment, but at the same time, it's a budgetary issue as well. Uh, but I, I think this shift will help us make a difference. And, it, and it then, again, I think it also helps us to think about how we are deploying officers as they come into our into our um, our agency, you know, uh, and what everybody's responsibility is as an agency. You may see more folks uh, uh, at the command level, whatever. Sh you should be on the streets too, and some of them are. But we need to make sure that our streets are fully covered, and I think that's the effort. That's where we're moving towards. And Madam Mayor, what do you see as the likelihood of uh, the cadets actually going forward through the program, but actually becoming Oh, I think that's highly, I think it's highly likely, and that's why um, I think we'll step gently this first year uh, to see how many actually, you know, it's interesting because both of these uh, are legacy, we call them legacy, uh, when you already have a, a, a police officer in the academy and you want to be like your dad, that's a great thing. Um, but we, we are going to really uh, recruit at the high school level. We, we want our police officers, and that's why the basketball leagues and all of the, the coffee, uh, uh, the police officers going into the schools, and it's really important because it helps to stimulate that interest. I think when I was growing up, if you asked, you know, how many uh, folks wanted to be a police officers, young boys' hands went up, not many girls, uh, firemen' hands went up. Um, you don't see that as much today. But I can tell you, at that recruitment piece for, uh, the high schoolers where we had 90 companies and corporations, including the city agencies, uh, these guys had the most people visiting their booth. And how's the recruitment going for the top spot for uh, permanent commissioner? I think it's going. <laughs> any, any candidates you can talk about? Or no, no candidates I'll talk about possibly. Do you know when you might have a decision made? I think we'll probably make one um, prayerfully. Uh, I, let me. Let me get, bring you back that information because I will get some additional information and I think it's going to be given to me before the end of the week and then I'll be able to share that. Have you picked these seven people to be the search committee? Um, everything is underway. Everything is underway including the national firm that's working with us. Commissioner, what update can you provide us uh, on the investigation into Taylor Hayes' shooting? It's ongoing. Uh, that's, that's the most I can say about it. At, at this point, um, we're working aggressively. We're, ne we're leaving no stone unturned with respect to this. Okay, we've got some great announcements coming up next week. Stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.